<laughs> it's pretty pretty amazing. One of the things I found really hard to kind of grasp is how can you go your whole life carrying that a belief? Yeah. And not rec not notice it, not know it's even that you're making a decision. Because it's like, if somebody told me that's what I was thinking, I would have said no, but don't. But actually seeing it in myself, it's like, oh, shit. <laughs> that's what I think. Yeah. Well, if you go back into the ancient... Uh teachings they said take care of the heart for out of it are the issues in life it wasn't take care of the head and the heart is the unconscious there's a gentleman that i worked with oh this goes back 30 years ago and he was an ophthalmologist and he had a system of lights that he would use to go he would use a light to go into the eye and to impact and stimulate a part of the brain it was a very powerful treatment. And his take as an ophthalmologist was that there are enough connections possible in a single human mind to match the number of connections possible would match the number of molecules in the known universe. Not the number of grains of sand on a beach in Florida or Florida and Africa and South America. The number of molecules in the known universe is possible in one mind. Harvard research search says that in a time frame where 10,000 brain cells are firing, 10,000 units of electrical activity are happening, we get in our conscious awareness that thing called perception. We only get nine bits. Mm -hmm. So having a way to drop into the underlying hidden part to me is the most important skill that somebody could have because nobody knows what's controlling their lives and everybody's trying to figure it out. You know, in my codependence intensive workshop, I, I go through what I call the pseudo solutions of the non-being mind. And the number one pseudo solution is if I could just figure this out and you can't figure it out. But you could do exactly what you just did, Yanka, and you can drop into it. And, and, and it doesn't necessarily, it usually takes some time and it takes some willingness to really become cognizant of what it is you're touching into. Like you got that clear memory. You had the brain cells to be able to get that. Somebody doesn't even need to be to that stage where they're fully cognizant of, you know, what that memory is. All they need to do, and that's why, you know, several times in worksheets, we remind people to breathe. Before you go into the core of the forgiveness process and canceling the goal, we ask you to connect powerfully to the active presence of love. If you're breathing and love is present and you're holding a smile on your face, then that energy is going to move. And you may not even be cognizant of what just moved, but it'll move and watch your life change. Mm -hmm. So nice piece of work, Yanka. Yanka that's awesome. Mm -hmm. In two miles. Yeah, it made me realize when you talk about trying to find the answer outside yourself and the answer is inside. It was like I real I realized that I could see that I was I was trying to get everybody to to see me, kind of hear me. I'm here, and it was like no one just wanted me to recognize me, not this search of looking outside of myself and relationships and the things that I did. It was like it was never out there. And it's not until you actually see it in yourself that you realize what somebody's saying. Do you know, like I hear you say it, but I don't see it, but now I can actually see it in myself. Right, beautiful. There's a young lady here in the States that um, actually for several years did a radio show after she had done this forgiveness work. She'd been to Heartland and done intensive. And uh, her radio show was, there's no out there. <laughs> Yeah. I'll just take a from the day. There we go. So, do you want to start with the questions that I've got from other people? Please, let's go for it, yeah. Yinka. And then, if anybody else wants to ask a question, if you click on raise your hand, and then once I've gone through the questions people have sent me, I'll go through the raised hands. Um, but Maggie is first because she did message me. So, you won't have to raise your hand. Awesome. Yeah, 
Um, so I'll write, write the, read these ones out. Uh, I've wrote, wrote them on a scruffy piece of paper, so that'll be read me and write them. Oh, um, there's, there's a lot of different worksheets. Which one is the best to do? Uh, what's best to start with? Which is, and they said, which is most recent? Well, my, my offering would be that, um, we, I mean, we have a simple three step short form that we print on the back of a, a, um, a bookmark that can, you know, the core of the process there is there. And just, uh, can you give me one second? Yeah. Okay, I had some interference there, excuse me. So, and then there's the, the most current worksheet, which is the one we publish on the website as the number one worksheet is a seven step. And that's the one if people wanna go to depth each time that I suggest using. And it's something that's been in development for 40 years. And if you look on the website, you'll see there are, I don't even know how many we published there. Do you know, Jeannie, about how many different worksheets are published on probably 20, 20 or 25 uh, on, the, uh, on the website? And uh, each one of them has been a test of how do we get to the core of what the issues are. And so, what I've found or what I, the feedback I've gotten from people who have really practiced that and used the worksheet is that if they, is that they use the worksheets, excuse me, I've still got some interference going on here and I apologize. For So again, what I suggest people do is go through and take the ones that really appeal to you. There are different ideas in each worksheet and practice with each of them. And there's several people who've told me that they've found it beneficial to rotate. They'll do a certain worksheet for a week or two and then they'll shift to one of the others. And they'll shift because each one has got a slightly different flavor and each one goes to a slightly different place. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there are actually seven different children's worksheets, and I've had a lot of adults who've tried to do the adult worksheet and go, mm, is this, you know, it's a summons. And they start off with the, the children's worksheet and, you know, right down to the simplest one, and they start to click and click with it and then work into the adult worksheet. So the, I guess the, uh, the, the full answer would be practice, practice, practice. Yes, I would agree with that one. Um, so I've not been doing the worksheets. Um, can I still benefit from the work and how do we encourage, I think, to encourage myself to do it? Or how do we get myself to do it? I just have to wait a moment. Um, My apology, and could, could you go ahead and ask that question again? I've got interference going on here, and I'm trying to delete it from my phone, and it's kicking me. <laughs> My apology. It's okay. We'll hold that space as you're holding it for us. So they've asked, um, they've not been doing the worksheets. Can they still benefit from the work? Um, and how do they get themselves to do it? Well, you know, every, every piece of awareness that we allow ourselves to step into, 
we're going to benefit from it. So you use the tools or don't use the tools, but my input would be to discipline yourself to maybe at least do one worksheet a day. And, and you know, one of the reasons why, in my experience, people don't want to do worksheets is, Yanka, exactly what you just shared was, you touched into something that was pretty deep. And when it happened, it was pretty devastating. And when people get the intuitive sense that that's where they're going, a lot of times they're like, well, I don't want to go there. My input for the person who does that and again, that can be an unconscious decision. But my input is, you don't have to be aware of the painful experience to be in pain from it. Actually, a lot of the behaviors of our culture are anesthetics that people use in order to hide their pain from themselves. And so, but the benefit is when I allow myself, when I'll do the work, when I'll use the worksheet, and I allow myself to go there, I can free myself from my unconscious pain, the pain I didn't even know was there. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not that by avoiding it, I escape it. It's just that I experience it as deteriorating my physiology if I never look at it. You know, there's that old saying that says, you know, the, the brave or the coward dies a thousand deaths, the brave only one. I go look at it once and yeah, it's intense and it's painful, but once I move through it, I'm finished with it. If I never go look at that, my structure is suffering from it 24-7, 365, and ultimately, literally, on a physiological level, when you think of it, the body as energy, it's literally the stuff that kills us. So that would be my encouragement for you. And yes, of course, each new piece of awareness gained, there's going to be benefit to it. Yeah. We did have someone on this morning who said that they saw us, that they're making themselves suffer even more by doing the sheet. And then it was, I was explaining like that when you were saying about going through it, it's what well, it's the suffering that you're going through, at least it stops. Whereas if you continue with the belief you've got, the suffering is going to continue. I don't know if you would word it differently. Well, it is a process for sure. And the deeper you engage, the, the more the benefits are going to be. Somebody's asked, does it the same apply for all religions? Because they're not Christian. They're this, this is not a Christian process. It's got nothing to do with Christianity. It happened to come out of the teachings of this man, Yeshua, from 2,000 years ago. But... You know, it, it's like, you know, the analogy I would use is, so I'm a, I'm a carpenter and I'm a Christian carpenter and I made a hammer. Does that mean I'm the only one in the world that can use a hammer or benefit from a hammer and it won't be of any use to anyone else? No, that of course is silly. It, it, it's, it's got, you know, sadly, many of the most powerful teachings, whether it's been from Baha'u'llah, whether it's been from Muhammad, whether it's been from Yeshua, whether it's been from you know, the Hindu perspective, has been turned into a religious idea. When it's not, it's just, here are the tools, here's how it works. And it works equally for everyone. If I'm gonna build a house, I need a hammer and a saw and a level and a square. And, and there's no such thing as a, you know, a Muslim hammer and a Christian square and a, you know, it's just here are the tools, that's all. And everything that I teach comes from the perspective of here's how you make it work. And it doesn't matter who you are. You can go kicking and screaming. I don't believe a word that this Michael Rice says. That's okay. Just use the tool and your life will change. You can say, I don't believe that a hammer could drop in a nail. But if I put it in my hand and I pound the nail, the nail's going to go in. That's all. You don't have to believe anything of it. Not a thing. Thank you. Um, let me just see the sheet. This is a question that's not necessarily on the worksheet, but she's poor. Every time she decides to eat less, more food just shows up and she loses herself. <laughs> so it's not necessarily to do the worksheet, but maybe she needs to do a worksheet on it. <laughs> it's, it sounds like some food worksheets would be good. Yes. Mm -hmm. What, what, sounds, sounds like a part of her unconscious keeps tempting her. Yes. 
because she said she was a lot of food just goes up every time she decides she's gonna eat less. How would you start the worksheet? Would you start it on? I would start it on food and, and, or it might be a worksheet on myself. You know, if I find that, you know, I want to eat more than I know is healthy for me, then the worksheet might be on my, me. So I'd put my name in number one C and, you know, the situation might be I overeat and the goal might be, I want to be in control of my appetite. Or it might be uh, when I'm in pain, I find myself going to the refrigerator. The goal might be, you know, to cover my pain with food. So it could be a thousand variations on a theme. And the more, and, and this is one of the reasons why you might do the same worksheet more than once, the more accurately you identify a goal and you get to the precise goal that's the key in this particular situation, the more powerfully that perceptual construct of the moment that holds pain is going to collapse in on itself. And the more powerfully it collapses in on itself, the deeper you get to reach into that hidden part of the mind and clean out the garbage. That goes into the next question, actually, because somebody put, do you do the worksheet for every emotion and for, and separately for thoughts or just one per situation? Well, what I suggest that you do is you, if, you know, if you find yourself, I've got this thing going on and my mind is telling me that I'm angry and sad and afraid. So I'm going to do a worksheet on anger. I'm going to do a worksheet on sadness. I'm going to do a worksheet on fear around that situation. So each one is separate. And here's the reason. Literally, when you realize that perception is a construct of the mind, you know, the world has taught us we have eyes and we see out there. And that's just the silliest lie that's ever been told. Nobody has ever seen anything in the world ever, and you never will. We have eyes, yes. We have a, an antenna that receives light energy. That light energy brings information into the brain. And according to the frequencies of light that come into the brain, information stored in the brain is resonated, is set into activity. The energy that's set into activity is basically thought. And so if I have a particular event that happens and the light that comes in conveys something to my brain, my brain literally constructs what I think I see out there. I don't see with my eyes. I mean, it's, the eye is a one-way valve. You can't see out of it information comes into it, you know, thinking that you can see out of your eye is about as silly as thinking that you could take the antenna off the back of your TV and look in it and see out through the antenna up on top of the roof. You can't see out of the antenna. And so we've, we've been taught this false idea that we see things when the truth is our seeing happens with our brain. And so if a particular event resonates thought disorders that result in me having fear, thought disorders that result in me having hostility, thought disorders that result in me having sadness. Now I say I'm sad because I saw that, I'm afraid because I saw that, and, and I'm angry because I saw that. The truth is, no, I have anger, I have fear, I have sadness. And I'm feeling that because that's what's in me. And this event, the information that came in, resonated those thought disorders and those thought disorders literally energetically we have this amazing device our mind takes thoughts and turns them into pictures you know this may not wholly apply in in some of the other countries that are participating but back oh i don't know maybe 15 years or so ago the um the broadcast system in america was what they called analog broadcast. And analog means that, you know, let's say channel two, channel four, channel six, each of them has, you know, from a, an energetic perspective, a physics perspective, it has a, a, an energetic signature, a wave that carries information. 
So channel two has a particular frequency, channel four, channel six. And what they used to do here in America is they would then superimpose images, pictures on that carrier wave. So the TV antenna receives that carrier wave and it, it kind of like lifts out or it decodes the pictures and it shows the pictures on the screen. So the picture that's included in the uh, carrier wave is now showing up on the screen. Now it's like, so this is the TV's ability to decode. Well, back, I don't even know how many years ago, 20 or so years ago, they decided that all broadcasts in America were gonna be required by law to be digital, all TV broadcasting. So they got rid of these analog signals that contained pictures and they made them uh, signals that contained information, digital information. And so people had to go out and buy new TVs. If they wouldn't go out and buy new TVs, the government passed a law, you know, you had to keep everybody in the, the loop of the TV brainwash. They passed a law that if people didn't have a television that could decode the new digital signals, the government would buy you one and you would install it on your old analog TV, hook it up. And now when the new broadcasting system came out, you'd still be able to watch television because the decoder would convert that signal. And that's exactly what happens in the mind. Energetic patterns in the mind, thoughts, literally the mind has the ability to convert them into pictures. <clears throat> Digital images, excuse me, <clears throat> are converted into analog images, pictures. And so if I recognize I have a perceptual construct, an image in my mind that has these kinds of traumas or upsets in them, then I want to dissolve each one that I can identify. And that's why I wanna do a different worksheet around every feeling, a different worksheet around every thought. Because when I pull that piece of the signal out, that's when the resulting perception that seems so hard and so strong and so fixed and so real about out there, that's when it collapses in on itself and I get to free myself from it. I get to lose from it. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Just because it's, um, somebody's put it on here just because it was in relation to the emotions. What if I do not know how to describe the emotions I mean, do not understand myself. Okay, so you'll notice that there's a little box on the worksheet that says, draw it. Sometimes these are pre-verbal things. You know, I've had people who've gone back and have memories in the womb. They didn't have language. And so that's why we put, you know, from experience, that's why we put that little box in there that said, draw your feelings. Because oftentimes there are no words for those feelings. It was pre-verbal. Or it's maybe genetic and there's no recall of it, no way to, to put it into words. But that's where you've got a place and you start to create, you know, the silliest visual drawing and all of a sudden click, something moves, energetically something moves. And that's what we're looking to do is to get whatever that is that has been held. And sometimes these <clears throat> thought disorders may be 10 generations old when we really trace them back, when we really key into them, and when I'm able to pull them up and allow them to come forward in the presence of breath and the active presence of love, they come undone. I don't have to figure them out. They come undone. That's the magic of actual first century Aramaic forgiveness. Thank you. Um, you are most welcome. Another question and, is, sorry, go on. Yeah, go ahead. If, but I don't want to punish. I think it must be on that punish part. If, but I don't want to punish. What? I'll say that over the last 40 years of developing this, one of the most common comments in a live workshop that I get on the worksheet is, yeah, well, I don't have any punishment thoughts. Oh, okay, well, what is it you want to do? Oh, I just want to leave. <laughs> no punishment thoughts, but I want to leave. You know what the most disastrous punishment you can do to somebody? Is isolate them. But 
in a culture where leaving is part of the culture to me, like one of the major things that needs to be healed on the planet is this whole issue of leaving. It's, it's like it's become so ingrained in our psyche that we think leaving. I mean, if you think about yourself and an experience of being abandoned, how horrendous that was. And you say, why well, do I mean punishment? I just want to abandon them. I just want to leave them. <laughs> you know, yeah, there's, there's punishment there. You know, 99.999999% of the time, there's punishment. And I may not be in touch with this, so I do maybe just mark it unconscious, unaware. Yes, I want to leave. Okay. So, you know, what they've shown is in prisons, when they put people in isolation in prisons, they go nuts. They go literally crazy because they can't handle the isolation. That's one of the most horrendous punishments there is. Which is a pretty sad commentary on punishment in America because there's still prisons in America today and I hate to acknowledge it or admit it that were designed to keep prisoners in isolation and they're still in operation even they know exactly what they're doing it's crazy we've got lots of forgiveness to do on the planet around leaving isolating punishing that's a big one that one it's major. <laughs> Let's ask, what's your religious background? Say again? They've asked, what's your religious background? Mine? Yeah. My my original uh, upbringing was in the in the Christian world, and as I say, the focus of this work has come out of the first century Aramaic language and the teachings of Yeshua. People call him Jesus, but his name wasn't Jesus; it was Yeshua. And when I first came in touch with his teachings as an adult, my background was electronics with a side study in physics, and I was a naturopathic physician. And what I saw in it was, ah, oh, this isn't about theology. This is about psychology. This is about genetics. This is about physiology. This is about how this energy system called life works. The man was a physicist. He wasn't a theologian. And when you start looking at it from that perspective, it all just starts to make sense. And then you realize that each and every one of what are considered to be the religious figures in truth are really about, here's how the energy system works. Here's what I've discovered can help you clean it up. The more effective teachers of showing people how to clean up their lives have become the, you know, have risen to the top. And my offering is none of them in their essence were religious. It's just People who've discovered we are human beings. We are made of the stuff called love. All you have to do is hold a newborn to verify that for yourself. And we've lost it. How do we return? How do we get back to who we are as human beings? Well, the number one key is you got to get rid of what you're not. You know, there's, I think I may have shared it on one of the earlier shows, but uh, there's a, <clears throat> a story about a tourist who's looking at the statue of David as Michelangelo was finishing, you know, chiseling it out. And he looks at it and he's just like amazed. It's like, how did you do that? And Michelangelo just said, well, David was in that piece of granite all the while. All I did was remove everything that wasn't him. If you remove everything that isn't you from your genes, from your cultural programming, and from your own life, all that we left is your created essence, which is love, period. And we're all the same. It's the same with all of us. Some people have got terror and trauma and rage and hatred and vengeance and you know violence and viciousness and murder structured in them. So they we say that's a murderer. And the truth is, yeah, you know, that's someone who's killed. But the truth is, they're not a murderer. They're no different than you and I. They're made of the same stuff. And do people need to be punished for the terrible things they do? It's the most ridiculous thing. Like we're on the punishment planet. One of my things here is to end this whole idea of punishment. 
People say, well, they did something terrible. Shouldn't they be punished? No. If you look at somebody who did something terrible, you've got somebody who was hurting and hurting people hurt people. So let's see now. We're going to reform the world by taking the hurting people who've hurt people and hurt them more and see if we can fix the world. I mean, it's crazy on its face. Yes, there are people who need to be isolated from society. You know, a murderer definitely needs to be isolated from society. Do they need to be punished? No. What they need is healing. If we're ever going to get to a planet where we function as human beings, then everything that's not human in us is going to have to be healed. That's all. And that means some pretty crazy stuff is going to have to be dealt with. It's going to have to come up. And so the idea of this work is to create a space where within ourselves, individually, within our family systems, within our own communities, wherever we are, and, and it doesn't matter whether it's a Muslim community or a Christian community or a Hindu community or a Sikh community, whatever communities we're in, can we function as human beings? And when we do, there's going to be peace in the world. Actually, there's going to be, if you go back into the ancient Aramaic, the, this statement where we're told, he said, you know, my peace I bring to you. It wasn't that. It was my serenity. It's like we all have within us the source of the same serenity. But if we've got patterns of hate and fear and rage and guilt that are unresolved, then those things get in the way. And they darken our experience, our perception of the moment. And we're here to support people cleaning it up. Wherever they are, whoever they are, whatever they've got or whatever they don't have. <laughs> mm -hmm. This is just a personal question that's come from about the punishments and thing that you just said before. Right. How do you know the difference when leaving is out of punishment or leaving it is out of um, it's time to leave? I think the difference is night and day. And the reason for that is that literally every thought we think creates an energy field. Back about four decades ago, I used to speak at a conference called Global Science. And one year, a gentleman named Marcel Vogel, who was a 23-year senior scientist from IBM, showed up at the conference. And he brought along a thing. I think I shared this in the last show, the Delaware camera, where he was able to, he, he showed us pictures of the high energy waves that leave the mind when we think a thought. If I'm leaving out of vengeance and hatred and fear, and uh, I'm, con I'm conveying all of that to all the world. Guess who I'm going to probably move when I get, or meet when I get a mile down the road? I'm going to find somebody who's going to play out that vengeance and fear with me. If I get to the point where I recognize, you know, this relationship is complete, you want to live one way, which I'm not in agreement with, and I choose to live another. So I bless you. I honor you. I honor the time we've had together, and it's time for me to move on. Now I'm not leaving out of rage and fear, and I'm not sending out a literal high-energy wave that asks the world to send me another abuser. It's like I'm ready to live in a space where I can create relationship that supports the truth of who I am and where I'm here to support the truth of who you are. Now we've got a whole different thing. Energetically, the communication. I mean, there's nothing we know of in the physical world that can stop the high energy wave that leaves the mind when we think a thought. Everything we hold in us is communicated continuously. If what we hold in us, you know, when you think of physiology as an integrated energy system, Relative to that energy system, there are energies which build the system up and energies which tear the system down. If there's a tear down energy in our energy system, then our physiology is deteriorating. Now, it's interesting in the Aramaic language, the word that is used to describe the tear down energy is the word sin. And it's an archery term. When I fired the bullseye and I missed the bullseye, the scorekeeper yells sin, you're off the mark. That's all that word means. Now, you look at the baggage that the religions have put on the word sin, and it's horrendous. When the truth is, it's just I'm engaging in energy that doesn't belong. Now, my offering is 
that if I engage in energy that doesn't belong, hate, fear, rage, guilt, you know, a, a system made for love is going to be torn down by those things. And so it seems that the way the creation is set up, accidental or otherwise, that if I'm in resonance with something that in alignment with pain and suffering, then I'm going to set up a high energy wave that's going to draw in somebody who's going to play out pain and suffering with me. When I decide to go inside and clean that up, I'm no longer sending out a literal high energy wave that draws that person to me. And then when they get here, I draw that out of them. I'm literally sending up, setting up a whole different energy field. And it doesn't matter in what arena I'm doing that. It doesn't matter if it's in relationship arena or financial arena. If the underlying thought is, I'll always be poor because I don't deserve anything. I could win the lottery tomorrow. In fact, they've done research on people who won the lottery and people who are in dire poverty and dire streets when they win the lottery, a year or two later are broke again. Doesn't matter, a hundred million dollars, it's gone. Because if, if one holds, I'm supposed to be in dire poverty, then they'll set up, you know, what do they need? They need the thief to come and take it or they need to get greedy or they need to get drunk or, you know, whatever they need to do, they're gonna produce that result. The idea of this work is that if I see that there's a pattern in me of producing a certain result, I can go to work and undo the underlying aspect of that pattern so I can go somewhere else, so I can live differently. Fit makes sense? Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Um, one more question and then I'll open it up for other people because I do the worksheets quite often on people how do you catch I don't know if you'll be able to answer um, but when people get distracted when you're doing the worksheet and they wander off and their attention wanders off how do you catch them to bring them back to the worksheet because you tend to see not... they get wander off into the story right talk about something else or they'll I've seen them get up and actually well, leave and do stuff yeah. and try and change the subject. Right. You know, there are a thousand ways that we've set up to try to avoid. And the mind, and, you know, when I work with people directly on worksheets, what I focus on is bringing them back. In fact, we did a worksheet a couple of weeks ago, remember, and, and about six times we had to come back because the mind is is... It, it's set up all kinds of distractions. And if you notice yourself being distracted, and that's one of the reasons why it can be really useful to do the worksheet in writing, is if you find yourself being distracted, it's, it's easier to stay on track if you're putting it down in writing in front of you. I have people who say, oh, I just do the worksheets in my mind. And to that person, I have a little song I like to sing, and that is uh, Neil Simon's Slip Sliding Away. You know, the nearer your destination, the more you slip sliding away. When people get closer to the core of their issues, that's when they want to turn and look the other way. A thousand distractions. And I've seen it take people, when they start really moving some things and getting in touch with some things, I've seen them run away from this work. And I've seen it take 10 years for them to go back and say, tell me that again. I need to hear that again. That's just a part of, you know, the distractions that we put ourselves in. Thank you. There's an interesting, there's an interesting video. I don't know how, how available it would be over there, but I'll just put it out there. I know that we can, I've, I've bought a couple of copies to share with people on Amazon. It's called, May I Be Frank? Mm -hmm. And it's a story about a, a restaurant actually in California. And, uh, it's called Cafe Gratitude. And in Cafe Gratitude, when you first come into the restaurant, they ask you a question. They've got a question of the day. And the question of the day on one particular day was, what do you want most of all? And this overweight um, New Jersey Italian gentleman was touched by the question. And he said, I just want to be loved again. 
and then went into a tirade about how nobody could ever love him because he's 100 pounds overweight and ugly and you know all of this the two young men who were servers in that restaurant one of them was his father was the owner of the restaurant these two young men kind of built a rapport with this man they went back to dad and said dad we want to take this man on as a project and help him heal and they ended up creating a video called may i be frank and it's just it's powerful because it shows you know in a very practical way what everybody's going to go through if you actually want to heal everybody's going to have to do this there's just no two ways about it everybody has got this kind of stuff to deal with but there's one particular scene that you know you bring up when you uh, when you ask that question and that is that he really wants to get back into relationship with his daughter and he has a woman that when he was a younger man, he dearly loved. And, you know, between them, they just totally destroyed the relationship. And so it gets to the point where with the support of these two young men, he's really stepping in and doing his work. They end up flying his former wife out to California. And they're sitting in his living room, having a conversation, you know, and it's like, oh, it's so sweet to see you and everything's so wonderful. And then they get into some of the issues. And... I don't remember exactly what the issue is, but the, the, the conversation turns to an issue where he still has just is just loaded with rage. And it's powerful to watch. Let me back up a little bit. Earlier in the film, they show how they designed a contract with this man. And, and part of his commitment was he would only ever he would, was only allowed to eat what they fed him from the restaurant. And they literally went into his house. They video doing this. They went into his house. They took all the garbage, all the drugs out of his refrigerator and freezer. And when I mean that, by that, I mean all the, the meat and all the chemicals and all, just all the junk, all the sugar, all the caffeine, took all of that out. And it's gone. And this guy is, is interacting with his wife and these, this young man's moderating their discussion. And he goes into a, just a fit of rage. And he gets up off the couch and walks through to, and here's his habit. You can see his distraction. He walks through and opens the refrigerator door. And he looks in the refrigerator and he just closes it because he realizes all his drugs are gone. There's so many drugs in this culture, so many anesthetics that people use to distract themselves. And, you know, that's just part of the healing process. I, I wish there were a way to just, snap a magic wand and you know have all that disappeared for everybody but everybody's got to do their own process and everybody's got to come to the to, to strengthen their minds to make new choices or actually i shouldn't even say new choices i, I should say it more accurately it's to come out of old decisions and begin to make actual choices That's really a uh, hit something for me as well. Well, uh, let me just take it one step further, just a little more of a demonstration of the principle. You know, the way what we call the mind works is the law of resonance. We've talked about that before. The law of resonance is this when two energy fields are in harmony with each other, when they're in tune with each other, there's an exchange of energy between them. So if I say to you, don't think about the color of your car. I set up a frequency with my voice. Now, the truth is, I've never said a word in my life and neither of you. We call it saying words, but what it is actually is there's a little flap of skin in the back of our throat, and we've learned how to pass air over it to vibrate it to make these air molecules move. And we call the air molecules moving when they hit the ear a sound and words. But the truth is, I'm not saying words. I'm just vibrating a flap of skin. In fact, there's a, a good video where they had Mick Jagger hitting some of his high notes and they've got a camera down his throat watching his voice box. It's, it's amazing video on YouTube. So, so that vibration, that energetic pattern that we set up and call speaking is nothing more than a frequency representing the thoughts in our minds. And as I recognize how that energetic system works, I realize that most of what I say I think is nothing but like the color of my car resing, something from the past firing in brain cells. What's the front door of your house look like? 
Well, you can see that, right? Well, that's thoughts moving. Is, is, is that something, is that thinking? What's your favorite item of clothing? You got brain cells for that. All of that's the past just representing itself and that the mind representing things is, is what properly we call a decision. It's not a choice. It's not even thinking. The truth is, if most people said what they thought, they'd be speechless. It's just a decision. When we wake up to who we are, we start to source mind energy that the mind has never seen. Now we're functioning as humans. Until somebody does that, they're not even human. They're just playing out a program, playing out the past. You, know, you go back and you look at the, the you know, Western scriptures. It says, look to the lives of the fathers, for ours are but a shadow of theirs upon the earth. We're just playing out the patterns of the generations. Forgiveness deletes the patterns of the generations and makes room for actual thinking, for us to actually source mind energy originally that's maybe never been seen in the world. And that's what we're designed to do. That's when life really starts, when we function as people who actually think and choose rather than just go by the old decisions from the generations, the generational patterns. You know, you look at that story about the Jews wandering in the desert for 40 years and you know, you think about that. How do you get lost in a 35 square mile area for 40 years, years when you understand astronomy very well? I mean, that's silly. And what had to happen, if you read that story, what had to happen for them to get out of that desert, to get into what they called the promised land? To get out of the desert, they said the old generation has to die off. Now, to the root of the word generation, is genaria, it means cause. It doesn't mean everybody in old physical bodies had to physically die. What they were saying is to get out of the unconscious state, that the desert is just a code word for the unconscious. It wasn't about a 35 square mile sandy hot area. To get out of the unconscious. And what did they say had to happen? They said the old generation had to die. All of the causes held in the mind from the past have to be removed. And that's the core of this work. That's what we're here for. Thank you. That was really helpful. And um, I'll move on to people being able to ask questions. Um, because Maggie's first. If Maggie wants to ask a question. Cool. Let's go for it. Mm -hmm. And if anyone else wants to ask a question, if you just raise your hand, and then I'll go around and the circle. Uh, hello, Michael. I have a question. Basically, it's quite complicated. So I don't know. Um, basically, doing the worksheets, I came to certain thing few times, and I noticed that you right. know, um, me basically and things which happened to me in life uh, are very much rooted in the cause of looking to be like love unconditionally. Uh, you know, because I have that void from my childhood. Right. And that requires, you know, giving people too many chances, you know, and basically, you know, putting myself in a vulnerable position to get hurt. So doing the work that I came, you know, I'm coming to the point, you know, and I cancel my need of being what love unconditionally and okay, I can write it probably a thousand times, but I will never kind of feel it. You know, my my inside, my heart doesn't agree with that. And I right. don't know what to do if does this should be something I super supersede with my self-love or what should I do, you know, to solve that of my issue? Well, the core, the number one step, remember, in forgiveness Mm -hmm. It's the canceling of a goal. Yes. So the, so the first step there would be for you to cancel the need to be loved unconditionally. Yes. And I wrote it, but I don't feel it, you know? Right. The... Well, so this is probably going to be what they call, what we call your 77 times 70 issue. You okay. Know, 2000 years ago when they said to Yeshua, how many of these darn worksheets do we have to do? Is seven enough? Now, how many times should I forgive my brother? And the answer was no, 77 times 70. The Greeks translated as 77 times seven, but it's 77 times 70, which literally means 
I, this is the, the core issue. I'm going to have to do this an infinite number of times until I'm complete with it. And so that's going to be the starting point. And here's what's going to happen. When you finally collapse the interference in your mind that you create by this desire for someone to love you unconditionally, when that finally drops, then you're going to get to experience you're going to get to experience life without your mind trying to interpret fix get gain whatever it is that you're trying to fix get or gain and here's what will happen you'll find out that it was all a false pursuit in the first place Nobody, here's, here's my, the, the best news I'll ever tell you, and probably the worst news I'll ever tell you. Nobody has ever loved you, and nobody's ever going to love you. You have never loved anyone. Nobody is, and you have never loved, are go, never going to love anyone. Because love isn't something we do to each other. It's what we are. When somebody sets us on a false track, we keep looking for the impossible, looking for the impossible, looking for the impossible, looking for the impossible. And of course, we never find it. So we go, oh, well, I guess I just don't deserve it. When I stop looking for that, then here's what I discover. What I'm looking for is what is looking. It's who I am. I am the active presence of love. But as long as my mind is screaming and raging about I need to have in a fate and if only and I have so much sadness and so much pain and so much loss and so much. Then I'm never going to get to taste myself as the human being that I'm created to be. And that is love. Now, one of the best ways I know to prove that to yourself. Have you ever do you have any children? Yes, I do. I have daughter. Okay. If you go back to the first time you held your daughter in your arms, I mean, actually think about the first time you held her, what position were you in? How were you holding her? Let your hands go into that position and imagine that you're holding her again for the first time. And everyone else who's listening, if you've got that experience, just go back to that moment. And now, bypassing all of your own thoughts and feelings, allow yourself for a moment to tap into the essence of your daughter, her true being, her true essence. And if you tap into her essence, what word would you use to describe her, her essence? For me, that was, you know... I just like, I hold her and I just like melted. That was just like pure love, you know? There you go. Now, here's my question. Be with that pure love right now. Is she loving you or is she love? Yeah, and I know you asked that question many times, but I think actually the correct answer is both because it would be, in my opinion, different for the man, different for a woman because the child grows in the woman's body so the connection is there just from the beginning yes but but my offering is you know we we talk in our cultural world about oh i love you and, and what that really means is as long as you're fulfilling all the goals i have for you i approve of you and if you stop doing that you know, think about somebody that, you know, you've said before, I love you. And then notice the only time you're upset with them is when they're not fulfilling your goals. So is love when somebody's fulfilling your goals or is it really, is that really love? My offering is most people, what most people call love is just approval. Mm. And so that pure melting energy of love is what your daughter is. Your daughter wasn't looking at you and going, saying, hi, mom, here I am as love. She was just being. Mm -hmm. And that's the truth about you, too. 
but the world put all kinds of conditions on. Oh, you're not, you're, you should have done this. Oh, you should do that. When you fulfill all of mom's goals, when you fulfill all of dad's goals, when you're a good girl, when you're, and, and all of a sudden mind gets in the way and we become overwhelmed by what we're not. And that blocks the experience of who we are. Okay. So now what needs to happen is we need to learn to forgive what we're not in order to get back to experiencing who we are. Okay. You can back to that experience of yourself being that pure presence of being that you experience with your daughter, then you'll know who you are. Okay. Well, because good breath. Yeah. That was uh, hard breath. Um, because, yep. you know, as we spoke before, I, what I said, you know, my grandma who passed away when I was young, was the only person who loved me unconditionally because my parents were very conditional. And I'm trying to be, and I feel like, I don't know, 99.9% I am with my daughter because ever, right. even we argue and things like that. And she was like, oh, you don't love me anymore. I was like, I, I always say to her, that's not true. I love you anyway. It doesn't mean I'm always happy with your behavior, but I love you. That doesn't change it, you know? So my offering would be a much healthier conversation to have with your daughter. Would be to say, sweetie, right now, you know, there's some goals I have for you and you're not achieving them. And that's bringing up hostility for me. And now it seems like I'm now pointing my hostility at you, which I am. But that's got nothing to do with the fact that you are love. That's yeah, that the truth of who you are. Whatever I point at you, that's my problem. This is mom's issue. I have my hostility. And yeah, last night when you were out late and you didn't tell me and, you know, and then I found out you did this. All my disapproval stuff came up. And I'm working on cleaning up my disapproval of you. In the meantime, I want you to remember and I want you to know who you are as love. And that's exactly what I'm working on too as your mom. In fact, maybe we could work on this together. Tell you what, would you sit down because I've had this issue too. Would you sit down and just hold the space for me? Just be that sweet, presence of love that you are while I work through this worksheet on myself not feeling like I'm loved you might find yourself you've got a very yourself a very powerful ally in healing this wound that probably goes back many generations in your bloodline because I never it's never like I love her in like any less or whatsoever the only thing i said to her i still love you the same way i did but i'm just right now not very happy with you know what happened you know yeah. and i'm and i'm not happy not like i'm not happy with her but i'm not happy you know that makes me feel basic right. upset you know but you, but but you notice that that doesn't mean a thing to her what means a thing to her is she's not experiencing the presence of you as love mm -hmm. and she interprets that through the same brain cells that you passed on to her that you interpret it that you're not loved she interprets it as i'm not loved and she's mm -hmm. taking responsibility for what's going on with you it's the same issue that you have with your parents and you know it's a it's a it's one of the most common issues on the planet and we need to be cleaning up because that's the original wound that most people suffer from their whole lives and never find a way to work through it and so you know I suspect if you're typical, like most of us are, that we'd probably have to go back many generations to find one parent and one child who went through their whole childhood, each experiencing themselves as the presence of love and knowing that that was the truth about them. And so that's what's going to be, you know, Inca started out this show was sharing a worksheet she did and a powerful unconscious part of her mind came up and whoa, didn't even know I was carrying this. I think you're getting closer to understanding what you're carrying in the way of self disapproval that was taken on by that relationship with your parents. And, and fortunately, you're committed enough to be working through this with your daughter, but just notice how she interprets it and she's interpreting it the way you interpret it. And it's probably gonna be many, many worksheets to get through to the other side of that where you can say to yourself when you think of yourself, oh yeah, that pure melting presence of love. 
mm. and you let that into your physiology, you let your heart soften, you let your heart open. You know, in fact, mm. put your hand on your heart right now and just breathe into that. Wow, the truth is, what's stored here in my being, the truth of my being is the active presence of love. And I can let my head connect to that part of my heart and the truth about me. You see, um, I know like my parents married because I was on the way. Uh, they're still together. Right. But the mar marriage was never, never like fully working. You know, th there's no harmony in the marriage. But they kind of get used to living together. Uh, I don't want that. I never wanted something like that. But I know because I started asking my dad about my grandma and things like that. And I think my grandma didn't feel felt love as well because her mom, so my great grandma, died when she was in early teens. And she her dad remarried and the stepmom was quite not nice and she moved out my grandma with her sister they moved out of the house you know to start started living you know out like together but you know you know what i mean not in a family house basically and the brother right. The two brothers, which were there as well, move out as well. Basically, the stepmom separated, you know, um, separated children from the father, basically. And uh, they were left kind of to manage uh, through life by themselves. And, you know, soon there was first and then second world war. So and that was in Poland. So that was really hard times. So here, here's what we call you. We call you an early adopter. And that means you're the first one in the family system that's awakened beyond the family pattern of pain and trauma that's been going on for how many generations, and you're working on healing it. And that's a big task. You know, when you're the first one and who knows, two, 10, 100, maybe 100 generations that's actually yeah. started to comprehend this, that's a giant piece of work. My parents, both, in, including my dad, they kind of emotionally switched, switched off. So that was, you know, always my struggle in my house, in my family home, you know. Because, well, would have, yeah. you know, they would buy me things, but they would not show emotions. Well, you now have a tool mm -hmm. that will change those patterns. It's not going to change tomorrow. Mm -hmm. It's not going to change next week. Here's what I guarantee. Five years from now, 10 years from now, you'll still be doing worksheets on these issues. But what you'll be doing is you'll be cleaning up a pattern that's been going on forever in your bloodline. And you know, in the Western scriptures, they talk about, they're talking about energy now. Here we're talking about genes. That's why I said, this is the teaching about physics, physiology, genetics, and psychology. So when they said, the sins of the father will be passed, yea, unto three and four generations of those who hate me. So let me, let me unpack that statement. First of all, again, the definition of sin in Aramaic is, it's an, an archery term that means off the mark. So any energy that's off the mark for a human form that's made for love, hate, fear, rage, guilt, grief, drama, and trauma is stored in that system and passed to the next generation. So the sins, the energies off the mark mm -hmm. of the, the, the previous generations will be passed to three, four generations. That means that in your structure and in mine, Every thought, every feeling, every perception, every reality generated by every person in the last four generations, that means, including me, 31 lives, is stored in my genes. Mm -hmm. It's all there. What your mother and, and father, what your grandmother and grandfathers on both sides, what their grandparents did and what their grandparents did are all stored within your structure right now. And all of that was passed on to your daughter somebody's got to get conscious enough to to work through that to clean that up now yeah. when you think about four generations 
Where do you suppose four generations back got their thoughts, their feelings, their perceptions, their constructs? Obviously, they got it from the previous four. Who got it from the previous four? Who got it from? You know, if you go back just 30 generations, uh -huh. in the genes of each and every one of us, there are 1.6 billion people. What do you suppose the 1.6 billion people that came before you and I have been through when we look at the history of the world? World War I, World War II, Korean War, Vietnam War, you know, <laughs> Spanish-American War, Civil War. I mean, like, what have we, what have we been through? It's oh. insane. Yeah. And now we're at an age where we're emerging as love and starting to wake up and go, oh, we could be doing this differently. You know, if you go back, I mean, there's a lot of pain, a lot of suffering, crazy stuff, wars going on still. But if you look at it, you know, if you look back 50 years ago, the hundreds of millions of people that were starving and didn't have clean water and, you know, the tragedy that was going on in the world, you know, in the last 50 years, that's improved so much. There are so many people that are waking up to service and living as love and cleaning up the mess on the planet that it's monumental. And it's like you're taking things to the next level of, oh, what's the possible human? I'm going to do my part to clean up my genes so that we can do this together. Yeah, because I would like my daughter to have, but I, I always was saying that I want her to have a better life than mine. Yes, well, I'm with you 100%. I have four granddaughters and I'm especially interested in cleaning up what's been happening to women on the planet and the energetic patterns that women have had stuck in their minds and stuck themselves with. Of course, there's responsibility, but also the abuses that have taken place and such and cleaning that up so that we get to move to the next level of living as human beings. So thank you for the work you're doing. Millions yet unborn will benefit from it. Thank you very much. And and I just know, you know, right now we're creating an energy space. And this energy space is always available to you. Tomorrow, next week, next month, 10 years from now. You can always tap back into this for support energetically and know that you're supported in doing each and every layer of the work that you need to do to do this. Thank you, Michael. You are most welcome and deserving. Blessings. Oh, um, Gabriella next. Is she still there? Hey there, Gabriella. Yes, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. I didn't know how to unmute. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for having me and thank you, thank you Michael, for being here. Um, I, I forgot my questions because you covered quite a lot and it was actually covering one of my, some of my questions, but I think mine is a little bit, uh, I, right, I will tell you like that. How is that possible? What I see from my side, like some people don't have to have the same problem as me looking for the answers. Like they are completely normal. Like I, I don't want to say I'm not normal, but, but but I'm looking for something because something is there. What is I feel it inside me that something is there. But some people are completely normal. They don't take it that seriously. They just go with their life. They don't question things. They're doing things. They don't look for the answers. And then coming to me, myself, I'm looking for an answer. Why? I hope it makes sense. Hello? Yeah, um, I think he's just got the signal mic on a moment. Oh, excuse me. I had, I had muted. I had started to speak. If you look in the opening of my book, you'll see the introduction begins with a quote from Henry David Thoreau. And he says this, the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. What is called resignation is confirmed desperation. From the desperate city, you go out into the desperate country. You console yourself with the bravery of minks and muskrats. A stereotyped but unconscious despair is concealed under what are called the games and amusements of mankind. To be awake is to be alive. 
I've never met a man who's quite awake. So don't let them fool you that there are all those normal people out there. Under the surface, and I'm saying this from experience of 50 years of working with people continuously, everybody's carrying around a load. They may be able to live on the surface of it. You know, they get home and say, well, all I need is a fifth of scotch and everything's fine. Oh, just give me my sugar cookies and I'll be okay. Well, let me smoke a little weed. Oh, let me take my antidepressant. My offering is that there are not many what we would classify as normal people out there. I think that 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 kind of makes sense. And uh, thanks for that. It was just I was like really questioning myself, like what is going on with me, like why I'm searching and stuff. Then I'm talking to other people; they're completely fine, or they seems to be okay. Right. Well, that's the brainwash of the world, you know that that you're the the only one with the problem. That's kind of that's kind of one of the early thought disorders. You know, we're designed to live in a condition called. I mean, if you watch a small child, you know. Uh, two, three, four, five, six months, they are in enthusiasm. I mean, they can even get enthusiastic about painting on the wall with what's in their diaper, right? You know, they're just enthusiastic. And we're designed to live in enthusiasm. And in theos, theos means the creator. We're designed to be connected to love. We're designed to live in that. And what happens is someone comes along and gives us a message and that message is usually something about, and you could touched into it very directly, very powerfully, that you shared in the beginning of this uh, conversation. And the, the first message that's given to many people, you know, when they first meet the disapproval of their caretaker, is there's something wrong with you, you're broken. And people start to, you know, what's wrong with, why am I like this? What's wrong with me? Yeah. And that's, that's everybody. That isn't you. I mean, we're, we're kind of taught to think, well, I, you see, that's something unique with me. No, no, that's virtually everyone on the planet that's doing that game. And when you realize that, then you let go of another thought disorder about yourself and you realize, oh, here I am, a human being made of love, waking up to the truth of who I am. I have some work to do. I have generational patterns, hate and rage and fear and sadness and grief and who knows what else. And I'm going to breathe. I'm going to put the pen to the paper. Paper. I'm going to do my work and clean up my life. And when we can get enough people doing that, who then cleaning up their own body, mind units, their own temples. This is the temple design. You know, you look at that. Again, the Western scriptures, do you not know that you're designed to be the temple of the living creator, the living God? Yeah, you're designed to be the embodiment, the incarnation of active love. Not some guy with a beard on a throne somewhere. You're designed to be the incarnation, the arrival on earth of active present love. And all you've got is a thousand generations. It was taught something else that was pretty stupid that you need to forgive, that you need to remove, to let yourself fully bring that into, to have that fully incarnate into your form. And that means that there's going to be a lot of old garbage that's going to have to splash up and be cleaned out. And that's just part of the process. So, Michael, do you believe, like, there is a possibility to, to live the life really, like, completely uplifting and feel like free of this all thinking burdens or anything is ooh, I'm talking behalf of myself on my personality or on my on my body I will say on my chest or anywhere like that and then feel the life like same as the kid like when you're born like you just come here and you are really you are just a human being and what you are you are a love because that's what you see when you see a baby it's just basically yes. a human being and pure love nothing else that, that it doesn't give you love no it's just Absolutely. there and you're just looking at it and that's it is is this is possible to achieve Absol that again? absolutely two thousand percent and guess what you won't get it done this year nor next and you won't be done with it in 10 years and you won't be done with it in 20 years and you probably won't be done with it in 30 years but you'll have a good start 
because you're probably the first one in your bloodline in 10,000 years that's thought of it as possible. Oh, that's good. That's, that's good. That's really good. The first one. I mean, think about what we've been doing on this planet for how long? You know, 75, 175 million people killed in war in the last 75 years on this planet. Look at the insanity that just happened here in Texas. Some 18-year-old kid goes out and buys himself a, a, a high-powered rifle and shoots 18 10-year-old kids. I mean, what kind of craziness is going on that we could possibly do that? Yeah. Well, yeah. the kind of craziness is going on is the craziest, craziness has been going on for a long time. There's a tool called forgiveness that if you use it, and let me tell you that it took 35 years of me working with it full time to understand it and how to apply it. And if you use it, you will achieve that result. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Michael, my last question, this is not going to be, uh, I hope you don't mind this question. If you don't want to answer, then please don't answer. Go I just, it. this is my curiosity more because uh, Obviously, you achieved what you achieved in your life and you created what you created in life, which is really like uh, remarkable and it's really beyond beyond and about everything. Uh, how is your day kind of starting? How is your like when you start the day? What is in your mind? If you can share such a things like that, how is your like day going on when you are actually having any like a, let's say negative or I don't know whether you have well negative is there always like uh, this how do you process this I use every tool that I've got every tool that I teach that's how I learned them and usually the last thing I do at night there's a process we teach called still point breathing it's a way of using the breath to cleanse the body of traumas usually last thing at night I go into still point breathing and first thing in the morning when I wake up, I'm in still point breathing and I take time, you know, unless there's some big rush going on for the day, I take time to connect to love and to cultivate my relationship with love. Michael, I think That's you share the most valuable things for me. So thank you very much. Thank you for speaking with Honored. me. Honored. Delighted. Thank you. Pass it on. And then we've got Bryony next. Hello. Um, I just want to start by saying thank you so much to Yinka and everyone else. And um, I'm very new to all of this material. So I'm very excited to hear you speak, Michael. So thank you so much. And the first question I have is, is quite simple, but just to help me understand, because um, I've heard this expressed before, but I feel like I don't quite get it which is you'd said, if we were to say what we were thinking, we'd be speechless. If I'm understanding that correctly, do you mean that's because we're never truly thinking, but rather we are just regurgitating stuff that we've heard and just kind of parroting things that we picked up? Cycling information from the past. Mm -hmm. Most people call that thinking. So. Let's, let's imagine, let's define the word, word. If I were to define the word, word as a tool of communication, and that when you're using words, tools of communication, it's indicative of an interaction between two. Would that be a reasonable definition? Would everybody agree with that? So words, word is a tool of communication, indicative of an interaction between two. Right now, I'm talking or you're talking and we're listening. So there are two of us involved. So if that's a reasonable definition, I'm going to invite everybody that's listening to notice that there are words running your head that you're not saying to me or anybody else, right? If words are tools of communication, indicative of an interaction between two, who's in there with you? Who's telling you the meaning of everything you think you look at? You know, Go back to Yeshua and 2,000 years ago, he said, in order for you to live, you've got to die. <gasps> what does that mean? I'm supposed to put a bullet in my brain? No, that's not what it means. It means that there is a false identity in each of our minds, a false identity based on those power person messages about what's wrong with me. And I've formed a picture in my mind of a body that I think I am. 
And I need to disconnect from that image of self to make space for the truth of who I am and to actually have original thoughts come in, to be in a space where I can conceive of something that perhaps has never been conceived of before in the creation. Then I become an actual thinker. I become an actual human being. Until then, I'm just replicating the past. Thank you. That reminds me, I had heard that apparently in William Blake's um, eulogy, uh, he'd said that he'd already died seven times in his lifetime, as like a nod to that of dying to yourself. Wise man, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And um, my second question, and this may be a bit naive, and also because I'm new to the material, I understand that, um, yeah, it, it may land in an awkward way. What I'm wondering uh, is, is uh, zooming out and perhaps reflecting on like there being a divine unfolding, you know, in life. Um, it's this deeper curiosity for and it's perhaps not coming maybe from a victim place, but just like a trying to understand um, about why that um, the hatred, the trauma and the pain, the suffering is passed on, you know, through our DNA and our genetics. It's like a curiosity for, for why does that mechanic exist in this world? Like, what is the purpose and the function of that? And I guess my thoughts are, is that designed to wake us up? Yeah, my offering would be that if you think about the fact that if the friend that I talked about earlier that was an ophthalmologist said that there are as many connections possible in one human mind as there are molecules in the known universe, what do you suppose the game would be like if we were each using that? look very different probably <laughs> that's when we'll understand the question you just asked <sighs> until then it's like trying to put you know here's an ant looking at the eiffel tower trying to understand it. tell me about the eiffel tower i want to i want you know go back to yeshua 2000 years he says there's so many things i want to say you you can't hear them you got no brain cells you got to have the eyes to see and the ears to hear. And this isn't a religious principle. It's just that you have to have accurate content to represent accurate meanings of what his words represented or each spiritual teacher that you might encounter or follow or engage with. You've got to have accurate brain cells for what they're saying or you can't hear what they're saying. Mm -hmm. So that's my take on what he, he meant when he said you got to have the eyes to see and the ears to hear. For he who having eyes does not see, and he who having ears does not hear. Well, gee, I just heard and saw everything. No, you didn't. You saw a construct in your brain from your past that reflected your past, and you think that's what was being said, and it wasn't. So, you know, there's, I talked about earlier, the number one in my codependence uh, workshop, I, I put out about a dozen different things that I call the pseudo solutions of the non-being mind. And the number one pseudo solution is if I could just figure this out. And in any given room, if I'm in a room with 200 people and I were to take the ages of everybody in the room down, write them down, add them all up, subtract five years for each person, I'd have the number of years the people in that room were trying to figure it out. And you know what? Not one of them's figured it out. Not one person in history has figured it out. You can't figure it out. But here's what you can do. You can forgive it. You can apply forgiveness. You can collapse it and make the space for, for truth to alter you. Then you'll enter real human life. But as long as I'm trying to take the energy patterns of my genes and my generations and my past and trying to fit what's going on out there into that so that I can figure it out. What I've just said is, well, I have this little ant brain and I'm trying to rewrite the universe with it so that I can understand it. Universe, you have to count out of my desires. And it's like, silly. I feel so seen. <laughs> <laughs> hey it's all you're not alone you it's all of us 
it's all of us we've all been doing it i mean that's that's what mankind's been doing for centuries look back read the philosophers what were they all doing trying to figure it out yeah. i i feel myself very fortunate that i ran into the teachings of this man who's who basically you know my interpretation would be stop trying to figure it out you can't do it but here's what you can do you can collapse the lap the lies in your mind so you're available to the truth right now and when you're available to the truth the truth will rewrite you the truth will change you and that's why it's so important to honor truth and if you go back into those western scriptures one of the definitions of god was truth <clears throat> The other one was love. You let truth and love rewrite you. You can just let go of your past and, you know. That makes sense? Yeah, 100%. And uh, I feel like, yeah, that sort of, if I can just figure this out, that's like the story of my life. <laughs> yeah. um, and it has served me well in some cases, but I think that that bigger picture, um, um yeah, I think that and to invite some humbleness and instead focus on what's here now rather than getting caught up in something like you said that um, with my existing awareness like is beyond me anyway. So it's kind of giving myself permission to let that go and focus on the, the real work that's here now. Yeah. And, and if you're open to it, you know, there's a, a line in what they call the Lord's Prayer. There's actually what they call the Lord's Prayer wasn't a prayer at all. It was a set of instructions. But there's a line in it from the Aramaic that could be properly translated as making a request of the creator. Creator, carve out a space in me for your wholeness. Mm. Like, clean, clean the seeds out of the squash so there's room for you in here. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. That's amazing. Thank you so much. I'm glad I asked that question. Thank you. So am I. Yeah, so delighted. Am I. So am I. <laughs> like, why is there suffering? Why must we do this? <laughs> Just the small questions. Just the little things, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Delighted. Blessings. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then we've got Gina to end. With. Hey there, young lady. Hey, thank you so much for the scene. You are so welcome. For your time. Well, you are in the light, young lady. I know. I know. Sorry. Okay, I'll move a bit. That's okay. There we go. Okay. So what's on your mind? Okay, I've got a few questions, um, I'm afraid, but my, my most burning one is, um, well, they're all burning, but this is the most burning one. You know, you say in the worksheet about uh, accepting, what was it, the symptoms of healing? You know, that kind of... Well, no, it doesn't say to accept the symptoms of healing. What it uh, says is, I'm willing, willing, I'm willing to go through the symptoms of healing. Yeah. And here's the idea. If I'm in resistance, you know, let's take a water hose and water's flowing through it like crazy. And I twist the hose and I twist the hose and I twist the hose. There's a hundred gallons supposed to go through the hose. And if the hose is wide open, the hundred gallons will go through in a minute and a half. But I twist and twist and twist. And now to got hundred gallons through this hose is gonna take 10 years. Mm -hmm. Untwisting the hose is the willingness I'm talking about. If I have generations and generations of hate and fear and rage and separation and pain and trauma and such, and I'm all wrapped up in knots inside, twisted up like that hose, and I open that, God, I could spend a year in that trauma moving through it. I like to call willingness the cosmic grease. When I'm going to take a breath and I'm just going to soften. I'm going to. Are you breaking up a bit, Michael? Let's just say that bit again. I'm going to let that soften. So, willingness is the cosmic grease. The, so, it's the willingness part. Because my question Correct. is. Correct. That's it. Yes. My question is how long do these symptoms take, if that makes sense? Because that's what I'm most afraid of. Because well, I'm I'm grieving, as you know. Okay. And sort of any any no. negative no. emotion. I I a, I'm not very good at feeling, really. I'll change that. I'm brilliant at feeling. Um, so. Um, so if I have, if, if if I have the hundred gallons that's supposed to go through the hose, and the hose is totally twisted tight, is going to take ten years. 
If I unwind the hose by 25%, it's going to take seven and a half years. If I unwind it by 50%, it's going to take five years. At what, how much is my willingness? You know, how long is it going to take? I have no way to tell how much willingness you've got, how you, willing you are to breathe and soften and let this energy move through. But the more willingness there is, the faster it moves. So somebody that's in a state of unwillingness and resistance energetically, they can take something that took a pain that took two minutes to develop and 10 years later still be in that pain. Somebody can take a pain that took 10 years to develop and two minutes of full willingness and they're done with it. Yeah, so my, my sort of, you know, so I'm, I was going to ask, so when you're doing the worksheet and you uncover something, and it does take a lot of courage to do this, um, yep. can you kind of clear it <laughs> there and then in the worksheet, in the space of doing the worksheet? I want it easy. I want it you I want here, easy you were, here, you were here when you heard Yinka share that at the beginning of the conversation, of course. Yeah, I was going to ask you, because you've had it all day, Yinka, haven't you? Mm -hmm. You were crying, you said. But that was more of a release. No, oh. crying, I'm sad. Letting go. It's been, whatever has come up, it's, it's allowed it to, yeah. it was that awareness of how long I've held this in. And it was more of a release of, oh my goodness, like, I'm just letting this, it's, it's going. And, and Yinka, uh, there were some people that weren't with us. Maybe you could just quickly share that again. Because mm -hmm. I did a worksheet this morning with the group, not this group, but um, this morning's group. And I, because I'm doing it as a group, I, t I thought I'll just do it on some different kind of mile so it could just open that sp space for people. I just did something really daft and foot, like on a fourth that popped up and it was like, right, I'll just do it on that because it's just small. And I didn't expect anything big to come from it. But my, a big thing came from it was a, uh, of, it took me back into a vision as well. And it wasn't a vision that I could see myself. It was a vision that I could feel into myself when I made the belief and I made a belief of I shouldn't be here. And I've been living my life every day from that belief that I, cre well, it was created as a child, but I've carried that and not realized I've carried that every day and every decision that I made. And I think the the crying was just that release of relief that I saw it. I like, I've carried that for forty of years of my life. This belief that just not been seen, and it, it, I think it was, some of it was shock as well of how could I carry a belief that I shouldn't be here for that length of time. But that and that was just playing around with a silly thought that well I thought it was just small. I thought I'd practice it this morning, and so you you can't doing the worksheets and, and kind of just going with whatever comes up. But I, and Michael's talked about before about the triggers throughout your day. You don't have to go dig totally into your past. Just dig into those little triggers that you see in the day. And that's what brought that out for me, that I never expected to see that or to think I thought. I didn't even realise I thought like that. I knew there was stuff in my past that's happened, but I didn't realise that that's the thought that I've been carrying all this time so you cleared it quickly then yeah it's come up it's yeah there may be habits that I will still have from that but I will never have that feeling again of I shouldn't be here uh, so that's a willingness and a symptom of the healing is that yeah. correct Say that again. that's it that's how it works so it can happen quickly. Okay. All right. Well, okay. Well, it's all gives, up to you. Mm, it depends on my willingness. So that gives me a little bit of comfort, actually. Because, mm -hmm. um, you know, I've got, well, a, a lot of things. I mean, um, one of my biggest things, well, is abandonment, really. Where would I start with a worksheet on abandonment? <laughs> See, this morning when I started, I started off with, because I wanted to get rid of my thoughts, like, just shut up. <laughs> like, so I thought I'll just play around with a shut up thought. And it, that's what brought me to, um, I shouldn't be here, because that's part of us, probably also part of abandonment, of feeling that I shouldn't be here. But that realisation that I've been, every decision I've made, is trying to seek somebody that validates me to be here. 
And it was like that awareness that I am here. And when I tune into that, I am here, changed everything that was, <laughs> it just changed everything that just knowing that I am here, that tuning into I am here. I don't need to look outside for someone to validate or say, I see you or you're here. It was like, I just needed to see it. But I've constantly looking out and distract myself because I'm always, but my friends always say, why don't you just slow down? Because I'm always distracting myself, seeking this thing of being here. And it was like, I am here. And everything just stopped. And that's when the floodgates opened of the tears and just sitting. And it allowed me just to sit with it in a relaxed state of, yeah, I can actually sit. Wow. And I sit all the time, you know, we all sit, but it, it was actually, I could sit and be here. Yeah, I hope I get there. Um, because uh, you've we're got, glad got... you're here, Yinka. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me too. Thank you. And it is in the worksheet, and I know Michael says, but I'm going to say it over and over again. Do the worksheets, even if it's the simplest ones, the ones for children. Play around with the worksheet. Allow yourself to play with the worksheet, because that's what's allowed me to do this. Was when I read the book, I thought oh, I'm just going to play with this, and I just played around with the worksheet. And I loved what was coming up because it was like, oh, I didn't realise I thought like that. I've told myself how I think, I think. <laughs> but it's like, no, you don't actually think like that. Now you're actually seeing how you really think. And what's it, been hiding behind those thoughts. And it's good because just listening to you, Michael and, and Yinka, it's brought up an awareness for me about, what was it about leaving, punishment and leaving? And, you know, what my daughter has done is she's isolated me and you brought up isolation and that's what sort of brought up so I thought if I work on this abandonment that I've I've had for god knows how well since birth then maybe that uh, these sorts of situations won't keep coming into my life does that make sense well probably Gina the the greatest atrocity that has ever been done to us and that we bought into and per perpetrated upon ourselves is that we have had hidden out from us the fact that we are by nature creators. We create out of the ba basic constructs in our minds. If it's, I don't deserve or I shouldn't be here, which is usually a message that comes from a power person, then I will tend to create my life out of that message. When I access the deepest levels of it, and it's usually blocked by deep pain, and most people don't want to go visit that pain, but that's where the resolution is, then most people stay away from it and then unconsciously create, create out of it their whole lives. It's having the courage to go in and do that piece of work that changes everything. Yeah, courage. We're warriors, aren't we? It's face that pain you know for me it's also having the courage to face what the well not mistakes but kind of the mistakes that i've made the the stuff that i've done I, that is continuing and if that has continued in my life i now have to go and face that to make that change it's a choice I, isn't it we can either have the courage to face the pain and and heal it or carry on with suffering right is that a fair comment yes yes most people are stuck in decisions whatever decisions in the mind are in the mind something comes along and resonates them and we just roll along with the decision we're talking about interrupting that whole process and bringing a whole new energy into the pattern into the creative process and creating differently yeah and it is life changing, isn't it? it well, if you do Absolutely. the work, if you do the work, as Jinka said, two thousand percent. And what I'll say as well is, but I can tell you my story. Michael can tell you his story. Somebody else could tell you their story. Until you do the work and see it within yourself, you will not know the story. You can assume what you think, but you—it's not until you actually do the work that you actually really see mm. what you think. But it is, as we've said, it takes a hell of a lot of courage, right? And well, I've said, well, willingness. Mm, sorry. Sorry, Michael, what was she saying? Willingness. 
uh, willingness more than courage. Yeah, a, little, a little courage helps, but willingness is key. And, and willingness untwists the hose. <laughs> yep. And I mean that on a physiological level. Most people live in what's called a sympathetic dominant state. In the sympathetic dominant state, in order to survive, and this is fear, fright, flight, or freeze. In order to survive, physiologically, the microcirculatory system of the body shuts off the circulation flow to all things that are not necessary to survival. You know, if you're out in the jungle and all of a sudden cancel the thought there's a lion chasing you, you don't need to think about you know, if you're a woman, ovulating, you know, reproduction is not very important at that point. If you're a man, you don't think about creating sperm. It's not very important. You don't have to think about elimination. You don't have to think about, you know, building uh, iron or building um, blood cells in the spleen. That's not very important. If a lion gets you in 30 minutes, you know, the spleen doesn't, all that stuff is shut off. It all literally, there are capillaries that have the, the guardian at the head of each capillary shuts down. It's a set of muscle fibers that shut that down and put people into a sympathetic dominant state. Most people in our culture, in our world today, live chronically in that state. And they wanna thrive and they wanna be healthy, but gee, their spleen shut down, their liver shut down, uh, the uh, case, reproductive- Kidneys. They, Kidneys exactly. in my case, which exactly. is fear. And people end up with all those things disordered and they go, oh, I've got a physical disease. Get out of the sympathetic dominant state, move over to where you're balanced in parasympathetics, and now you get to digest, you get to rest, and your physiology gets to thrive. It's what you're designed for. You know, Sympathetic dominance is a wonderful thing. If you're out in the jungle and there's a lion chasing you, you want sympathetic dominance. It's a gift. But once you've escaped the lion, you want to be able to take a breath, let go, and go back to the parasympathetic state where everything else gets turned back on. But if somebody lives there chronically and the capillaries are shut down, then the blood flow to all of those organs that have to do with rest, thrive and digest are shut down and that has to be restored and if that goes on in a person's life for years it takes significant work to get that to reopen so how uh, you know if you if you know how do you clear fight flight fight all of that well if um if you go back my radio show if you go to our website whyagain.org we started doing a radio show 11 years ago, five days a week, 52 weeks a year for 11 years, we've done a one hour radio show. So there were over 3000 hours of archives. If you went back to the first opening minute of our first radio show 11 years ago, and you started to listen, and you listened through that show and the next day and the next day and the next day and the next day, and you came up to today's show that we did. You wouldn't hear me do anything other than ask the question you just asked. That's how big the answer is. You wouldn't hear me answer any other question than one you just asked. Uh, so start listening to the archives. It's everything I teach. You know, if you were to order every DVD, if you were to listen to every workshop, if you were to, you know, that's, that's the question I answer. Mm. And I mean, we answer it from a nutritional status. When people do our intensives, we've got a, an app that has fresh and raw menus. We've got a Facebook page, a private base, Facebook page with uh, a whole uh, process for shifting your kitchen over to fresh and raw food. So you've got vitality that opens up microcirculation, opens up the possibility of moving back into uh, parasympathetic balance and sympathetic balance. Uh, everything on a physiological, emotional relationship, you know, every workshop, that's what it's dedicated to is how do you do that? So it's not just the question of keep doing the worksheets then. That's a part of it. It's every tool. Now, this whole body of work started out from the worksheet process. Everything is developed out of that. That's the core tool, but that's not the only tool. 
that's why the archives are there. Anybody can go if you just go to yagain.org and you click on the uh, the um, um, microphone. <laughs> The microphone, yeah, that's where my brain was going. <laughs> Click on the microphone and that will uh, open the archives. Just drill down and start listening. Wow. And, you know, every day for an hour a day, if questions develop, call into the radio show and ask your question. Ask what the radio show is about. That's what we're here to do. How do I call into the radio show? You, you got Skype, have you? Yeah, you can, if you go in... Uh, to the archives, click on it. It'll instruct you how to do that if you're in another country. And if you've got free US calls, you can just phone in. The phone call for phone number for the radio show is 563-999-3581, or there's a Skype link there. Right. I've added it into the um, chat as well. Okay. All right. So, um, so it's about willingness. Okay. Yeah. I'll have to cultivate that. Um, and my final question is, uh, have you got any YouTubes on still point breathing and meditations? Still point breathing is a tool that I teach only personally. I've, I've never written anything about it. I've never published anything uh, on video for how to do that process. It's something you need to be guided through. It's, it's a very powerful way of using the breath. And it's not something that I would just hand to somebody and say, here, go do this on your own. We do have a monthly um, Mind Shifters and Still Point Breathing uh, workshop that we do. We do that via Zoom. And the second Saturday of each month, we have a session that begins at 11 o'clock Eastern time for people who are registered. And then on the, the Tuesday following that second Saturday, we do a second session as part of the Mind Shifters and Soul Point Breathing. But it's just not something that I'd hand to anybody to use on their own. Mm, and you Wouldn't charge be. for that, don't you? It's 150 pounds. Well, no, I, I don't know how the pounds translate. A single session is $150 for the, that one month for the two sessions. If somebody does, a uh, a package of three of those sessions it's 125 each for the three sessions if somebody does uh, uh the year package then it's 900 us dollars for the year for that program if someone's done one session you know two days one session can they then go and practice on their own yes when you do a session uh, we record it on Zoom, and you get a copy of the whole session. So oh. you'll get the guidance, the instructions, everything is there as part of it. Yes. Wow, because I, you know, I do um, Alchemy of Breath. Um, Anthony, Antonia Begnigo, or whatever his name is, powerful, 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 powerful. A good way of shifting stuff, you know. Um, yeah, the breath and, is definitely key. Absolutely, yeah, and I love the way you say breathe after, you know, on your worksheet. You know, you put a like, breathe. Um, and you don't have any meditations on YouTube then? Are you there? There are. Are there? A couple of meditations on, uh, in our radio show archives. Oh. I had just told, um, there's one CD or download. It's, we have it in a CD, but it's also a, a streaming download. And I think. How much is the um, Wellness Through Stillness, Gene? Ten. It's a ten dollar uh, for the download. You can just go to our uh, the website whyagain.org and click on the catalog or buy products, and you'll see uh, Wellness Through Stillness. So you can order that. That's a twenty minute progressive relaxation for opening the energy field and regenerating. Wow. Thank you. Thank okay. You. And yeah. And I had told Yink I would get this information. Jeannie, she's driving the car and listening. And she just said that if you go to our website and go to the search bar and type in meditation, that will take you to several different meditations that we've done on the radio show. Oh. So Yinka, that's where you can get those meditations. 
Or you just go to the search to bar on whyagain.org, mm -hmm. type in meditation. There's several radio shows where as part of the radio show, I've done a meditation and then Jeannie's gone in and edited out and made them available. So what do we put in the search bar, Michael, to find those? Just meditation. Meditation. Just meditate. I did it today. Oh, you I did. did. I did it the other day, but I listened to one today as well. Oh, fantastic. And then all of this, the worksheets and the meditation and eating, I mean, you know, one step at a time for me. Um, this will bring me out of, because fear has been a biggie. You know, I do come from trauma. <laughs> so there's a lot of fear there, which, so, and doing all of that will. What I would say is about doing the worksheets. Sometimes what we think it is, isn't quite what it is. That's what I've learned. So I don't know if Michael, but that's what I've realized that when I thought it was fear, it wasn't actually what I thought it was. Oh yeah. So, I mean, where do you begin? So say I get a worksheet and I title it sheet one fear. <laughs> you know, how do you start one like that or abandonment? So I mean, how many times have we done this question, Gina? Mm -hmm. Um, I, 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 well, what was the, oh, what was the answer to it? No, what was the question? How many times have we done this question? Um, I have, I think, I think since we started doing this at least three times. So you've got the answer to that one. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't, I didn't write it down. Okay. Well, it sounds like you're gonna have to go back and listen to the archives. Oh, is that what you said? Oh, that was the answer. answer. Listen to the archives. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I will send. I can send you all the previous. If you email me, I will send you all the previous ones in the email where you've asked this question. What, where I've asked this question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you can listen to the answer. Let me, let me give you a hint, Gina. Go on. It's been every time we've talked. <laughs> every time. Every time. Mm -hmm. So notice that you're asking questions, but you're not listening to the answers. So you might but, want to shift that pattern. Yes. Yeah. Not listening. Yes. So that's another worksheet. There. Another now worksheet. there's a good catch. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. At least I'm not saying I don't know where to start. And well, maybe I am. I'm just worded it slightly differently. Mm -hmm. If you message me, I will send you all the previous ones. I'm willing. I am willing, you know. Awesome. Yeah. So Very thank cool. You. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. All right, young lady. Be Michael, blessed. can I quickly ask? If I buy the, sure. the download, that 20-minute one, would you mind if I just allow them once to hear it so people can hear what sure. it is? Sure, sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. I'm Go just ahead. wanting to get yeah. your permission to yeah. put it on just to, so that people can have a... I go listen to it, and then if they decide to want to go and buy, they can go and buy it. But I don't want to cool. obviously do it without asking you if you're okay. Yeah, no, that's fine. Go for it. Yeah. You. you know the work the work that we do we do for nothing because or pardon me I should say we do it free. We haven't figured out how to do it for nothing because we're committed to making it available whether people have got money or not. And we invite everybody. You know, if it touches you and it makes a difference, do something in the way of support. You know, we're li literally working to make this available on a global scale. And so everyone who steps up and says, boy, this has changed my life. Step up and, and there's a donate button. Are you just breaking up a bit? So I will share in the So WhatsApp. do we have any more questions? Oh, there you go. I will share all in the WhatsApp group for the donation stuff because this is probably where me and Michael do are kind of aligned, where, you know, I do all this based off donations as well and, you know, putting stuff out there so everybody can get a piece of this. But, yeah, so I will put the donation link in the WhatsApp group for Michael's stuff as well. Uh, you're, mute, um, you're muted, Michael. Do we have any other questions? 
Gabriella have another question? I don't know if that's a question in there. Uh, not sure. I think I don't. Uh, I, I think like you, like I really appreciate this actually session today because I was writing a lot during uh, how Michael was talking and also Yinka. And thanks for sharing your story because I think I was resonating with it so much. Uh, what you just said and you tapped into some of my actually uh, things, uh, so you opened something for me. But this was a really valuable session. Like I learned really, really a lot, and it's opened my eyes quite a lot mm -hmm. so I'm looking forward to the next one thank you and then the meditation don't forget it <laughs> awesome. yeah, so I will, I will, try, I will do, do that next time so you can have a, t a taster of what it's like because uh, I, I want it anyway you. thank you so much thank you yeah awesome thank you huge huge thank you Michael for you just kind of even like from this morning to now it's like everything just feels like it's just opened up for me so yeah thank you yeah, thank you, Michael. Thank well, watching, you. watching your arm movements, Yinka, mm -hmm. if you go to the Aramaic language, and the Greeks tell us about a thing they called the kingdom of heaven, those words are much more correctly interpreted with the words, one, the community of love, and the community of expansion. So it's quite literally about the expansion of the presence of love. It's not about going to some place in the sky after you die. <laughs> you. You're welcome, Joan. Delighted. And thank you everyone for joining thank as well and you know, asking questions and being willing to hear. All right, in two weeks we'll do this again. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, blessings. All right, thank you everyone, and I'll see you. See some of you tomorrow. Bye bye. Bye bye, Michael. Thank you. Bye everyone. Bye, Yinka. Bye. Bye, everyone.